Our guest in this segment was here about a year ago, shortly after the invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia, and did a marvelous job considering what was at stake and what was going on in her life at the time and with loved ones in describing the situation. Well, we are now a year into this conflict. President Biden recently with a visit and uh, now in Poland uh, today, too. Marina, uh, Marina McDonald is back here with us this morning. We'll catch up with her here as well. Marina, come a little closer to your microphone so everybody can, can hear you nice and clearly. And thanks so much for coming back in. Thank you so much for having me again. It's truly a pleasure. It's hard to believe that almost a year passed, and on, on February 24th, on Friday, actually, it's going to be one year exactly since the invasion. So um, I really appreciate for giving me another time to, to talk about it a little bit. When you were last here, you had parents that were still there, and you were trying to get them out. How, yes. did, how did that go? <clears throat> actually, uh, craziest story of my life, probably. Um, we uh, we made it work it worked out um my parents left um the city that that they lived in and they traveled to moldova to the border spent about 7 hours on the border in a cold it was march so it was still pretty much freezing outside um they were able to to, to move to moldova and at the same time i flew out of dc to 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 rescue them um, it was really hard. It was last moment. I had one day to plan the trip. Um, I ended up buying plane ticket to go to Romania, actually, because there was nothing really going to Moldova within my time frame that I needed. And, um, you know, I, I booked a hotel for them there. And it's kind of crazy. At the moment, I didn't buy tickets until they passed to Moldova because I didn't know if they're going to make it. Because at that point, if you remember, Russians were just shooting civilians that were trying to travel, escape, even those green corridors were open, as they call them, mm -hmm. where it's supposedly safe to travel. It still was happening pretty much. So it was insane to think that I'm not buying tickets to airplanes just because I don't know if my parents are going to make it. But they, they did make it safely to Moldova. And the next day they traveled to Romania, to the hotel. So I was flying basically just kind of blindsided, didn't know what I'm going to see, or what condition they're going to be in. And um, I did I did make it to Romania. It was an insane trip. Um, you know, it was a very emotional reunion with my parents, even though I just seen them a few months prior to that. It was a completely different. Our life changed, went upside down. So it was um, a surreal feeling, like seeing them alive and not not really well. Obviously, mentally and physically, they were extremely drained. But just seeing them uh, there and understanding that those people just fled their country. They, they literally had two little plastic bags with them, just medication and um, a laptop, I think. Just something, just the main thing that they could grab. Um, are they here in America now? Yes, they are. Are They're they with here. you? Yes, they live with me right now. And you still have some relatives there now? Yes, my sister, her husband, um, and they're actually helping um, my, um, her husband from previous marriage. He has uh, two two daughters, and one of the daughters have uh, kids. So she ended up going to to, to serve in the military to help out. Um, I think she has some kind of a nurse degree, so she's helping at uh, any local hospitals or wherever she's needed. And um, they're helping raising uh, the, the children right now so is they're very occupied uh, with that but I'm very grateful they're able to but they're not in my cities they had to move to the west part of Ukraine just because it's more likely to be safer than where I'm from from the south and what city are you from right now um, from Mykolaiv it's next to Odessa it's like very on the south border which got hit pretty heavily still getting hit today it was another really heavy um, missile shots um, in Kherson, which is mm -hmm. maybe like 30 minutes from, from my city. Vladimir Putin, in a speech to his people, said the war was started by the West and by Ukraine. And this is the line he's peddling to his citizenry. Is there anybody left in Russia who honestly believes this guy anymore? Because remember, the first part was that Ukraine was a Nazi regime. He was oh, there to yes. kill Nazis, and people were buying that a year ago. Are they still? Yes. yes, I think so. I think so. And a lot of that, I think, 
I don't I cannot speak for a lot of people. All I see is, you know, some social media posts and comments. I don't take comments too close because a lot of them are bots, you know, it mm -hmm. might be not realistic. But then I have a lot of people who have relatives in Russia. I have relatives in Russia because when it was part of the Soviet Union, everybody was spread everywhere. Everybody spoke Russian. It was very common that somebody would be serving in the military and then end up in some other country that was part of the Soviet Union. I was born in Soviet Union still. Yes, don't tell anyone, <laughs> a long time ago. But um, you speak to some people and they're talking about their relatives that they don't communicate anymore just because of that, because they say, oh, we don't believe it, all oh, this is fake, this is not real. Like everything they're showing, the missiles, the, the death, those dead bodies on the streets, this is not real, it's just fake propaganda to, to make us believe that, you know, we are bad. So it's it's... It's pretty heartbreaking, and those people who do believe, they're terrified to say anything. And it's absolute truth. I, I'm not protecting anyone's opinion here. I'm just saying my own opinion. Like they're scared to say something mm -hmm. because they're immediately becoming uh, an agent, how Russians call them right now. Like you are like foreign ag agent, and you know whatever you're saying is to say something against Russia. And if you're against, you're not with us. Kind of idea. So. John Gilstrap. We all, we all pray for Ukraine and, and, and for safety, and it's hard to imagine. I cannot imagine over the course of a year how much has changed for the average citizen of Ukraine. I guess my question is, what would victory look like? I mean, it seems like the, the, uh, the Russians are not going to just walk away. They're unlikely just to say, okay, sorry, and, and, and walk away. Ukrainians seem to be really focused, high morale. In, 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 at least that's what it's reported, very dedicated. Um, the United States and NATO are, are spending, uh, sending a lot of munitions and spending a lot of money to try to help. But when you look at this, and I know that not to ask, you're not, you're not a policymaker, but what do you think victory would look like? You know, uh, there's a big question right now that people ask, do you want a victory or do you want peace, right? And I think this is a very tricky question in this situation because, like you said, Ukrainians are extremely passionate ab about it, w what's going on, you know, especially since it, it, it's our neighbor who attacked us, right? It's not just mm -hmm. anywhere else from the world. From my perspective, and it's just my opinion, where I am a person who got affected by this not being there, right? I don't wake up to sirens in the middle of the night. I don't have to run to shelters. Um, but I look at my friends who are all volunteers right now, pretty much every person I know who is not on, in, in, in front of, you know, fighting Russians, they are fighting on their own front where they're volunteering, helping. Um, I understand that if right now, you know, peace is what I would wish. I wish it would all stop in my biggest dream that I wake up tomorrow and all this is over because it's it's been so long and so many people died. I have so many people I know who died because of the war. Um, what will victory look like? I, I don't know at this point. Are, there, are there pockets of peace? Are, within Ukraine? Are there areas that are fairly normal and unaffected yes. by the war not, physically? Not unaffected, but more peaceful, like I said, like western part of Ukraine, for example, is less affected. They do have sirens. They they still, you know, hiding in shelters pretty often, but it's not destroyed. You know, while we have some parts of Ukraine that are completely vanished, like you go there, there is nothing left. It's broken down buildings. It's it's complete death, silence, and nothing there is left, and no one is there. So that's why I think it's really hard for me personally. Again being so far from there, but just seeing my parents and seeing my sister and my friends who, who, who changed. Like I talking, I'm talking to them and it's like different people right now. They aged mm -hmm. for decades, over 12 months. Peace would be something that would just stop. I don't know how else to describe it. I just wish it was over, but I feel like we are so deep in this and I think victory would mean so much for those who are actually there fighting because they, they're fighting for something, but at the same time they have kids at home and, and if if they're still lucky to have somebody at home, so many of them don't. 
it's really really hard to describe what what I would imagine to happen and how perfection would come. Too many people died already. Whatever happens right now, families, thousands, thousands of people's lives are ruined. There's no way to, to bring them back. Um, so really, really hard to answer that. I, I don't have a correct answer for, for this question. I just wish it would stop at this point. Matt Harvey. How, and you've answered parts of this, but how's the the mood there with people that you've remained in contact with? How is what? The mood. Oh, uh, they're tired, very tired. And um, they're, they're volunteering. Like I said, most of the people I know are uh, actively volunteering, uh, collecting anything, name it, starting with collecting money to buy uh, any immunization, to finishing with warm socks and, and, and underwear. Like it, it it's very wide range of needs that people have there right now and so all my all my friends who are still there they're trying to help as much as they can like we donate money we try to collect anything we can to help those soldiers to help those old people who cannot even get out of their apartments anymore especially if they're on you know some nine or eight floor and there's no um elevators are working there's a lot of little things that they're trying to do but i think it helps them in a way they stay busy a lot of people don't have jobs there right now because there's no place to work at so that is something that keeps them occupied and maybe helps them not to lose minds to be honest with you I think a lot of that contributes to to just feel like you're still doing something with your life while so much terror and and, and fear going on around them is, is there a sense of betrayal because Russia and Ukraine used to be united Oh, huge sense, and I think I talked about it last time. It, it, I, I was in absolute disbelief. Like we knew, right? We, we heard news. We were talking a lot, like in American news, that you know there is so many of the soldiers surrounded around Ukraine, but nobody would believe it. Like I, till the day it happened, when I talked to my parents on the twenty fourth, and my city was one of the first ones that got hit. I could not believe it. It felt like a knife um, in my back and in everyone's back. It's it's our closest neighbor. We all speak Russian. I speak both, but you know, it, it it's hard. It's like your neighbor just came and, 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 and tried to hurt you for, for no reason. I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, but for average person like me who is not deeply involved in a lot of things or I don't understand exactly how some things work. Just me, average person who has family there, um, it was a huge feel of, of betrayal. Absolutely. Back to you, John. U Ukraine and Russia, historically, if, if, I, if this goes back a ways, really didn't get along very well, right? Even during the Soviet years, it was sort of a, more of a forced union than than a happy one. Is that correct? I was very little uh, when it was still part of Soviet Union, so only things I know is from you know history lessons or from my parents or grandparents growing up. But it didn't feel like that there was not too much go not getting along. I would say mainly um, culture, Russian culture was more pushed, of course, on any other country just because Moscow was the heart of the Soviet Union. So right now. You know, it's kind of amazing to see how a lot of people trying to get their knowledge on Ukrainian language deeper or culture and learn more about what, what's what been missing or what's been not talked about too much. But in the same time, this war kind of made a lot of things more clear. And I can see that those kind of conflicts, right, they don't appear overnight. And whatever was cooking, right, for so long, it finally came out of that pot. And, and this is what we have right now. So I'm not sure exactly of the details in the Soviet Union and how it was, but I definitely can see that a lot of things I, I grew up not knowing about even Ukraine, you know, and um, as much as heart development right now to see how how much you're trying to get more involved in the culture and learn more about Ukraine, I can see that we did miss out a lot on a lot of holidays, so traditions, the language, just because of the influence of a former Soviet Union. 
I just worry, I, you know, again, wishing all of the best. The, the temperature of the rhetoric is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Now we were talking about the China funding the Russian effort, and then President Zelensky's response to that, uh, sort of invoking the, the notion of a third world war. And it, I, I, I worry, everybody wants peace. I think at this point, you want to get that genie back in the bottle. But with the rhetoric running as hot as it is, and, you know, I, I hope there's a way out. I really do. I, I just, I, I don't see it. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, and especially, you know, how deep we are into this conflict right now. Um, it's it's hard to see the way out. I think at, at, at the beginning, everybody was saying, oh, it's going to be two, three months and it's going to be over. Then it's going to be like, oh, by end of the summer, it's going to be over. And now they're extending the war. Uh, I'm not sure how to say, it, but war position. It's going to be until like 2024, they're talking. So we are going now deeper and deeper in that. And there's no no vision of the end of that. It's the same for me. That's how I feel. And and that's terrifying because um, there's, there's not going to be no people left there. Yeah. Marina McDonald is our guest here on the program. And Marina, I heard a, a new story this morning that said at the beginning of this uh, almost a year ago, 60% uh, of Americans were in favor of sending weapons and helping Ukraine. That number's dropped to 48% now. Do you fear the world losing interest in Ukraine? You know, I was actually, I, I was going to say something about it. I think just like any other conflict or disaster or anything like that, it, it becomes sad statistics, right? And, and people are tired of listening, especially when we have ourselves so much going on here. We have so so much going on right now in, in America as well that um, require a lot of attention and, and, and help. Um, so I'm not surprised by those numbers, um, but just as a person, as a little person who is affected by that personally, by the conflict, it's sad for me to see that it's becoming a sad statistics, um, but I think it's unavoidable, if, if I might say, just because there is less and less news about it, right? There is less and less exposure exposure to that right uh, and and it's normal that people lose interest probably and um uh, they don't think about it as just something more relevant rather than some other conflicts and it's totally understandable um but i want to say that it's not getting any better there it's if anything it gets worse so any help that anyone provides i think it's so deeply appreciated by ukraine and ukrainian people um, and I think we're all going to be thankful forever for the help we did receive. So, like I said, I don't know much about numbers, but I know how grateful we are there. And I know that Ukrainians are, are very appreciative of how much help was um, provided so far. At least everybody that I know. Yes. Matt Harvey. So out of this conflict is Rose Vladimir Zelensky, who I'd like to get your thoughts on when he was first elected president, if you knew much about him, you know, he has an interesting arc to his presidency, which was a, a comedian and an actor yes. to a wartime hero. Yeah, I so I moved to United States in 2008, 2009. So when I was leaving Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky was still an actor. He was a comedian. He was very, very successful public person. Everybody knew him. It wasn't like somebody just came from somewhere and they learned about him. No, everybody knew who he was. I was really, really surprised uh, when he was elected just because I was already so far from Ukrainian politics and anything. I was here for too long um, to really to really know too much. So when it happened, I was, I was shocked, not in a bad way or a good way. I was just very surprised. I could not believe that because I used to watch his shows as a kid on TV all the time. It was part of our night routine, you know, it, he was, he's funny. Um, and then when he was elected, I didn't really think too much about it. I just thought about it. Well, another celebrity, you know, got elected to, to, to be a politician or president. Um, so I don't, I don't know much about him, um, in his, in, in his political career, but the fact that he is still there, he didn't escape. He, he stands with Ukraine as much as he can, 
and he's present and I, I respect that and I appreciate him being there. I don't know if he's a hero if he, or what he is, but for so many people there, I know for sure that he's kind of that, that, that light right now, possibly, just because he is there and he didn't run. We have a lot of people who ran from there and he did not do that. So I think just for that, um, I appreciate him for who he is. But I don't know much about him, unfortunately, just because it's been so many years since I lived there. So I don't, I don't experience effects of his politics on my everyday life. But I do appreciate him being present and trying to help and make as much of network connections that are potentially going to be helpful to, to the Ukrainian people. Marina, I want to thank you very much for coming in. Once again, it's not easy to discuss these things, especially with family involved. And as always, you're very brave, composed, and so mature about all this. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the questions. I hope I answered you did. some of them <laughs> uh, clear enough. But um, I appreciate you, and uh, thank you for having me again.